ourselves afresh to your agenda in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You see there, it says throne of grace on the monitor, on the, on the screen. That is actually from chapter 4, verse 16, the last verse in this chapter. However, as you guys know, context is everything. We studied last week through verse 13. Uh, however, to catch the context, because uh, you, you might look at this and go, well, all right, I understand this thing about throne of grace. And in, in verse 14, he starts talking about the high priest and Jesus being the high. So what does that have to do with the word of God being sharper than a two-edged sword? What does that have to do with all things being open and bare before him with whom we, we give an account? And, and, and uh, these things can be kind of confusing, but uh, we're going to back up. We're going to start again in verse 12 this morning. Because verses 12 and 13 set the table for the, the last three verses in this chapter. And, and this will be a shorter study for obvious reasons. We don't have as much time this morning. But we're going to go through it. We're going to look at it. Because there is some imagery here in the original language that is absolutely amazing. And, and you have to get into a kind of a Jewish mindset to be able to understand it, parse through it. So without any further uh, introduction, we're going to start out in verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin." Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So why does the question comes up, why does the writer shift gears here to the high priest when he's been talking about the word of God? And he, he begins to lay the groundwork for the, the high priesthood of Christ. Uh, and he talks about it in chapter 2, verse 7, and then again in chapter 3, verse 1. And now he's going to be beginning to really more fully develop this whole thing about Jesus, our high priest. He will talk about, in chapter 5, Jesus being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And uh, it kind of it comes out of the obscurity of the Old Testament, but there's some powerful, powerful things that, that the writer here is going to bring about. But in order to understand this, you have to understand, I don't know if you guys remember the first time that when I was introducing this book, I was talking about when I was in Bible college and the, the, our teacher every day would snap his fingers next to his ears and say, you're a Jew, because you have to approach it with a Jewish mindset. And we all wore coffee filters that one day for yarmulkes and it freaked him out. But uh, the, the point is, is that looking at Judaism in the first century, you have to understand this book was written to people who were they were having troubles. They were struggling. They were having troubles having, hanging on to Christ because they had moved away from Judaism, which was their life. Uh, here's what it, it would look like. As far as the culture goes, it was both ancestral and tribal in that sense. They, the Jews paid a huge amount of attention to genealogies. They, they were descendants of the 12 sons of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they had a tribal heritage, but then they also were close-knit. Within those, there were clans, all right? In, in the English Standard Version, the word clan is used 158 times. Now, in, in the New King James, it's used a couple of times because the word usually is families, but it's an expanded family. We're talking about a huge deal. Like Jesus, when he went to the wedding at Cana in Galilee, it was a few miles to the northwest of uh, Nazareth where he grew up, but that's, it was, he, they were part of the clan. It was part of the larger family. It'd be like us having a reunion, and these guys had lots of reunions. They did that often. And so uh, when they did weddings, when they did 
events that was always the clan that was involved. And so they had this huge, tight-knit group of people that they were a part of from the time they were growing up. Uh, I remember when my larger family would get together when I was a kid, and I would be so excited to see my cousins, and, you know, wow, you know, and we would go play until midnight at the park. Can't do that anymore. But, I mean, we would just have all kinds of fun together, and, and, and it was just a blast. That was the culture that these guys had. Now, uh, they also had the synagogue, and, and we talk about, you know, going to church, and, and, and that's become less popular in our postmodern era, and yet there's great value in that, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as this book states, and yet for them, synagogue was everything. For them, the Old Testament, the Torah, was where it was at, the, the oral tradition that was passed down from father to father, that he would be instructing his kids in Torah uh, all through their lives, their home life. And so they would be steeped in that. And then they would go to synagogue on Saturday, on the Sabbath, on Shabbat, and then the, the rabbi would teach them from the scrolls. And so they had this whole deal going. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm elaborating on this on purpose because I want you to really catch what life looked like to them. All right, uh, so nationally, now that's just locally. Now there was also a national heritage that they went with, that they were a part of. And in Israel, they had seven national feasts every year. And each one of these national feasts lasted for a week. That's a lot of time off. That's a lot of time to get together with the folks, you know what I mean? And, and so they would go, and, and they, were, they didn't go to every feast because they were relatively poor, and yet there were, I think, four of them were required to go. And if you lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem, there, there was a, another deal I read somewhere that you, you went to more of them. But they would, the whole family would caravan together. Remember we looked at when we see where Jesus' his family is caravanning back to Nazareth, and they, well, where's Jesus? We lost him. And they found him in the temple and going about his father's business and all that. So they had this whole deal. Now, Get to Jerusalem, and there is the temple, Herod's temple, all right? It took, uh, it, well, at the time of Jesus, it took 47 years from that time to get it to where it was, and it wasn't finished. It wouldn't be finished until just shortly before it was destroyed by the Romans. And so talk about a majestic, beautiful, I mean, over-the-top in every way structure. Uh, this, the, the, the foundation of this thing, the Temple Mount, was built actually on top of Mount Moriah, the very place where Abraham took his son to sacrifice. And, and I mean, this place had history. And then the temple itself being uh, the permanent location that had been the temporary and the tabernacle where God said, build me a tent. I want to dwell with my people. And so then now they'd go to Jerusalem. They'd see this majestic temple, this thing. It was just huge. It was like 90 feet high. And, and, and then they had the veil in the temple and the priests going through and doing all of the temple ordinances that they did. And the sacrificial system. It was amazing. In Israel, when they took the land, there were 12 sons, 12 tribes, and everybody got a portion of that land in Israel except for one tribe, and that was the sons of Levi because they were the priestly tribe. They didn't get land. What they got was the duties of representing God to the people and the people to God. See, that's what a priest does. That's what the priesthood is about. And so if they were sons of Levi, they were considered the priestly line, but they weren't exclusively the ones who carried out the sacrifices and all the stuff in the temple. Those were the sons of Aaron who were chosen from among the sons of Levi, and they were the ones who actually did the sacrifices. They were the ones through whom the high priest would come. And so you've got this whole deal going on, and the people would go, just looking at one day uh, from, from sunup to sundown, because the Jews separated every day from sunup to sundown into 12 equal parts. In the winter, it was shorter hours. In the summer, longer hours. But that's what they looked at as a day. Now, their day began actually at sunset the night before. There were four watches, three-hour watches through the night, first, second, third, fourth watch. And then at sunrise, the priests would begin their work for the day. And so 
what they would do is they would be engaged in making these offerings to the Lord. It was called korban, or, or the, the plural of that is korbanot. And, and so they would be offering gifts and sacrifices to the Lord throughout the day, every day. Now, this isn't on feast days. Feast days, they had a lot more to do and a lot more work. But in, in just a regular day, it started at the first hour. It's called they, again, they separated the, the, the days into 12 parts. So the first hour would be dawn. And then they would bring a lamb out. Uh, the first lamb would be brought out, and he would be tied to the horns of the altar. The altar was where they actually burnt the sacrifices. And, and there were four, on the corners of this thing, they had these things, they looked like horns. And so they would tie a rope, and they would tie the lamb to the horns of the altar. And the priests would then prepare the altar for that day's sacrifice. They would get the fire going, and they would get everything squared away so that they could go through. This is just a regular day in Jerusalem. This is also the time of the morning prayer and sacrifice. It was called the Shakarit, and it was 9 a.m. Uh, was would be the first hour of prayer. So you go forward to the first hour uh, of prayer. That, that would, I mean, the first hour was dawn, but the third hour would be 9 a.m., and that's when they would get into this whole prayer and sacrifice thing. 9 a.m., if you think of it, look at it in Acts chapter 2. Remember on the day of Pentecost, what time was it when the Holy Spirit came? 9 a.m. They supposed they were drunk. They said, no, it's only the third hour. And so these guys at, on Pentecost had assembled together to pray because that was part of the prescribed ritual in Judaism, in their religion. And so, again, these guys are steeped in this. They would get together and pray. The first lamb would be sacrificed. He would be slaughtered. And what they would do is they would pull back the head and expose the neck, and they would take one cut on the lamb. And I mean, and it would be a gruesome sight because cutting the carotid arteries would, it would make a mess. But you got to realize that this is for sin and sin is messy. And, and it was humane for the animals. It was humane for, in that sense, I mean, people have been critical over the years about, well, look at what they did, blah, blah, blah. It was nothing different in slaughtering one of those animals than any slaughterhouse. And it was a very humane, very quick death for the animal, but the first sacrifice, and the people would be looking on, they would see the priest pull the neck back, slice across the neck, he would know exactly how to do it, and the animal would be dead, uh, and then they would begin, and they would continue on with the sacrifice, so going from there to the sixth hour, which would be noon, the second lamb for the day would be brought out, tied to the altar, uh, now again, when there were special occasions, they had a lot more to do than this. For instance, when King Solomon dedicated his temple, he sacrificed 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. The, the Kidron Ravine, which is just adjacent to the temple, would have been flowing with blood. It would have been a horrible stench. It would have been a sight to behold. But this is just on a regular day, they're going through these ritual sacrifices, and each time would be an hour of prayer. So at noon, they would have the second hour of prayer, and, and they would tie the second lamb up. It was called the mincha, uh, afternoon prayer and gift offering. So uh, then at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, it was also called twilight, uh, this is actually, too, the time when Jesus was crucified. He, he gave up the ghost at three in the afternoon, the time of the afternoon or the evening sacrifice. They called that evening, they called it twilight in those days. And this is time for the evening prayer and the evening sacrifice. The second lamb would then be sacrificed, pull the neck back, um, cut its throat. Uh, and it would be the third hour of prayer. It was also called the Ma'ariv. So this is what was going on. And, and then the 12th hour at 6 p.m., by the way, at 9 a.m., they would open the gates to the temple. They weren't open at night, but at 6 p.m. at sunset uh, on the 12th hour, they would close the gates, and you were not to be in the city after sunset. That was, not, uh, that was forbidden. And so they would close the gates and go into the structure of the temple. They actually engineered it to where there's a lot wider gates coming out because there'd be a big crowd coming out and narrower gates going in because people would kind of mingle in throughout the day, but there'd be a big crowd coming out at the end. So that's what their lives look like. Uh, 
then you get to one day a year, and this is the day where the high priest would come from, again, from the tribe of Levi, from the sons of Aaron, and he would be the high priest. Now, high priests in Jesus' day were crooked as they come, uh, and yet the intent for the high priest on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, would be one day a year, he would go in behind the veil, and he would actually, he would take uh, a young bull for a sin offering for himself. He would have to go and atone for himself. He would have to atone for the, the tabernacle or the temple, for the, the structure itself. And then he would go out and he would make atonement for the altar. Anything that man had to do with, he had to ceremonially cleanse. All right? And then he would go and he would take two goats from uh, the people and, and he would... On, they would draw lots. One goat would be drawn for the sin offering for the sins of the people on the Day of Atonement. The other goat, the priest, he would be called the scapegoat. And the priest would literally lay his hands on the head of this goat and pray the sins of the people into this goat. And another priest would take him way out into the wilderness and let him go because he would be bearing the people's sins away. We see a perfect fulfillment of this in Christ where he was the, the, the sin offering but he was also the scapegoat. He is also the one that bears our sins away. All of these things are shadows. All of these things are living parables that point to a future fulfillment that Christ would have. Right down to the high priest. And that's where we're going with this. I just want, I, I want you guys to catch. That's what a day in the life, what a year in the life of a, a first century Jew would look like. It's into that that... Uh, this movement that formed around this rabbi from Galilee uh, came about. And, and that movement, it didn't collapse when Jesus was executed. Soon he resurrected. Uh, it was seen by the people as evidence that God had raised him from the dead. This was seen as a sign that the principal event of their end time understanding, they had an eschatology. That's what eschatology means, studying the end times. And they had an eschatology in Judaism that this would be a principal event uh, in their eschatology that it would begin the resurrection of the dead, uh, which they were looking forward to. All right? And so the Jews, by the time, go 30 years later, the, the assumption, the return of Jesus and, and his assumption of power in Jerusalem were expected, and they were expected fervently. The people were looking forward to that. That's what they looked at. And this continued again until 66 AD, and then in 70, when the Romans destroyed the temple, that was pretty much it for Judaism in the classical sense of, of their national observance of these things. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, we're told that many of the priests going forward after the resurrection, that many of them believed. It says, The word of God spread, and a number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many, that means many to the most part, of the priests were obedient to the faith. So that's what happened there after Jesus resurrected. There was a great excitement, and the people that were converting were looking for his soon return. Didn't happen. They were discouraged. They were, they were downtrodden. They were looking at, and people would look at them and say, all right, here you came from all of this. This huge deal, this huge religious machine called Judaism in the first century, and much of it was God-ordained, much of it was not, much of it was man, uh, sort of reinventing Judaism. But they had this whole big deal. And they say, now you get together and you meet in a house church? And you sing some songs, some worship songs, and you study the scripture. And, 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 and you know, maybe Uncle Benjamin comes over and says, what are you doing? You, just, you left all of this, and you got this. It's not much. You know, because he hadn't come to faith and realized that, that the, the very oracles of God were now entrusted to the church and not to this big religious deal. And so the people are struggling with that. They're trying to get, they're trying to wrap their arms around it. It's into that that this passage is written. And he says in verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We looked at the Machaira last week. Uh, this, this big knife or little sword. Uh, 
This is piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner. We looked at that. It's a critiquer of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So this small sword, this large knife, piercing down into the heart of man, dividing things that are soulish and things that are spiritual, showing us our hearts, the, the, the word of God exposing us, laying us open in that sense. Verse 13, and there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word must give, you see on the screen, it's in italics. That means it was added for translation. It says they're naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we account. So when we say must give account, that tends, I don't like that translation. I like the original better because must give account, it indicates a future accounting, and that's true. But what the writer is saying is there is a continual accounting before God that goes on. It's open and bare to him, to the eyes of him to whom we account. To him whom I account today, to him I account tomorrow. It's a continual thing. And there's this continual accounting that's indicated in the original. So when he says there's no creature hidden here in verse 13... The word for creature is actually, it's, it's a larger word. And what it's saying is, is nothing in creation is hidden from him. Nothing. Uh, and in Genesis 3, going back to Adam and Eve, they had just eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 3, chapter 9 and 10, after the fall, it says, the Lord God called to Adam and he said to him, where are you? And so Adam said, I heard your voice. Now, we're talking in Hebrews today. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Interesting. So we have the word of God, and someone hearing his word, hardening his heart, choosing not to go forward with God, not to fess up, but actually hiding himself, hearing the voice. And, and, and the writer saying, nothing is hidden. It's naked, and, and, and it's a clear indication that he's, going, he's reaching back. Again, he's reaching back to the creation, and he's bringing this to the, Jews, the Jewish Christians' minds and saying, nothing in creation is hidden from him. Go back to Adam. The fig leaf didn't do it. And anything we do to cover our sin today won't cut it. It won't work. He says, you're naked Nothing can be used to hide. And that's the writer's point here in Hebrews. Uh, next, we're going to look at the word open here. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to, we, to whom we account. This is fascinating. This is, there is a word picture here, folks, in the original that you just don't get in an English translation, but I really want for us to understand what's being said here. And it shows us why he goes into talking about the high priest immediately after this statement. The word open, the word, the Greek word is trichalizo. It's, it's the, the root word for what we use for trachea, all right? Throat. The proper meaning of the verb, and it's a verb, means to bend back the neck. Sound familiar? So as to expose it in front of an animal that's to be slain. It means to make bare, to expose the thing entirely as the naked neck is for the knife. The word picture here is undoubtedly to the sword. He has just talked about the sword. He's talked about the sharp two-edged sword which the writer had referred to in, in verse 12 as dividing the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow. The point, yeah, pun intended, in the hands of God who holds that sword, everything is exposed. His word exposes hearts for or against him. It is as though, listen to me, folks, if you, I want to talk about justice for a minute. Would it be just for God to use that sword Yes, it would. Because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, would it be just, would it be justice for God to kill us for our sin? Absolutely. 
Practically speaking, theologically speaking, absolutely correct. But remember, we're talking about the last verse here. He's leading up to this thing called the throne of grace. So if justice were to be carried out for you or I, that's what this word picture indicates, that our throat is open and bare before him who has the knife. And, and that word of God is in the hands of God. And that, this picture, it just blew me away as I began to dig and I began to study this out. Uh, but the writer there goes right from there into verse 14. He says, seeing then that we have a great high priest, who was the guy with the knife in that culture? These guys would understand what had been said when he talks about the trachea, about it being exposed, open and bare before him. And then in verse 14, he says, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Therefore, let us hold fast to our confession. What's the confession? That he went to the cross, that he took my place. He died for me. That that death sentence on me was real. And that as I simply trust him, that, that that sentence is fulfilled in him, dying in my place, and now I am covered by the grace of God. Beautiful word picture here. When he says, talks about Jesus being the great high priest, there's three things he says, he's, and, and there's no other high priest was called great. Jesus is called, he's not just called, he is our high priest, he's our great high priest. He is over and above. The word Greek, the Greek word is mega, all right? He is the greatest high priest that ever was. He is the fulfillment of all that the high priesthood shadowed, foreshadowed in the Old Testament. No other high priest passed through the heavens. What does that mean? That he he was not bound to the things of the priesthood that men as high priests were bound to. That as when, when he died on that cross, when he rose from the dead, when he ascended to the Father, that now he lives to make intercession for us, that he's seated at the right hand of God and he argues my case. He is our lawyer in that sense, that, that he passed through the heavens. The, remember back when the tabernacle was made, when Moses was given the instructions, and then they did the same thing with the temple. That was an earthly representation of the original, which was in heaven. He said, make all these things after the pattern which I showed you. We have the fulfillment of the high priesthood in Christ. Do we, yes, do we deserve death? Yes, if you're looking at justice, but we're going to look at this further and we're going to see that mercy comes into play. Grace comes into play. He ministers in the heavenly sanctuary. In Hebrews chapter 9, we'll get there one of these months. It says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He came as a fulfillment of that heavenly sanctuary. And how much better a high priest we have than what the Jews could have had in the first century. And that's the writer's point in this is he's appealing to these guys. He's encouraging them. No, you, don't, you didn't lose the high priest when you moved out of Judaism. You actually got a perfect high priest. You got a great high priest. And that's the point that he's making with these people. You don't have to worry about your throat being open and exposed because you are that animal. You have a God of grace. You, have, you are covered, you are bathed in the grace of God through simply coming to a place of trusting that he died for you. A great encouragement for these first century Jews who had been steeped in this stuff from childbirth all the way until they converted to Christ. And now they're thinking about going back and he's saying, no, 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 no. You don't want to go backwards. You, you, number one, salvation could never come from law. It comes on the basis of grace through the person of Christ, through the finished work of the cross. Verse 15, he says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Question, what about those things which the word of God has laid me open and exposed me to judgment? It says here that Jesus sympathizes with my weaknesses. That doesn't mean that he endorses sin. He never says, oh, it's okay. What it means is he understands that we're weak. He understands that we're feeble at times. He understands that we struggle. He knows our infirmities. He's enthroned in heaven, yet as our high priest can sympathize. Our great high priest is God the Son. Our sympathetic high priest is the Son of God. As a man, he understands, tempted in all ways, yet without sin. Now, you might think, well, he was Jesus, so he could be tempted. And, you know, that's, you know, he was, he was like perfect. He, that wouldn't be that big of a deal for him. No, I, I would beg to differ. The opposite applies because sin produces a callous on the human soul. And in never sinning, the temptations that he endured would have been magnified. They would have been amplified. And so you can't say, well, you know, he's Jesus. What's the big deal? No, he was tempted in far greater ways than you, you and I could ever experience. And yet he resisted. He never sinned. Interesting. The word sympathize means to suffer along with. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, close this up. I know we're running a little behind, but um, I do want to make this last couple of points here. If I hear of a tragedy somewhere, I feel badly for the people who were involved. You know, I, I, I hear of a school shooting or I hear of uh, an accident or, or whatever it is. Now, Let's amplify that. What if that tragedy has befallen somebody in my family? Now, I remember, I've had those happen. There's a whole difference that goes there. I share in the pain. I share in the grief. I suffer along with them. And many of you know what I'm talking about. There's a difference. And when Jesus looks at us, he sees us as family. When, when it says that he sympathizes with us, it's not from a distance. It's not from some unknowing thing because he saw a news clip. It's because he understands. He knows what you go through. He knows what I go through. He knows the hardships we endure. He knows the trials that face us. He knows the temptations that we, that we go through. And the word of God says he sympathizes. He suffers along with us in those things. That's our great high priest. A, a, a high priest after the order of Levi, sons of Aaron, couldn't happen. He was just going through the motions, man. He was just bring another sheep, bring another, bring another sacrifice. Let's go through. These are all prescribed things. And, and yet he would want to be faithful. But he couldn't come to a place of, of identifying so intimately and so closely with those to whom he was making the sacrifices for different with our high priest. That's the point. We're a family. We're part of the family of God. And when we suffer, he feels it. He sympathizes. Verse 16, let us there for it. Now, there's that word again. Because of everything that he said, he says, therefore, this is what we're going to do. Now he's going to apply it. Guys, when you see that, let us therefore, he's saying, let's apply this to our lives. Let's, let's walk out of here with more than a head knowledge, more than a rudimentary understanding of this high priest that we're talking about. Let's apply this. My neck was laid bare before him with whom I'm, an account, I'm going to account. And yet he said, no, he belongs to me. Or if you don't belong to him, guess what? That's in place. Judgment will come. Wrath will be poured out. That's part of it. But for those of us that belong to him, those of us that are his children, that his people that have come to him by faith, trusted in the work of the cross, that's done. Because he says, therefore, let's come boldly to the throne of grace. 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Notice he says the throne of grace, not the throne of law. He doesn't say it's the throne of justice. Because if it was, if salvation could come through the law, nobody would make it. If salvation could come because God is absolutely just, nobody would make it. It has to be on the basis of grace. He calls it the throne of grace because he is both the giver and the gift. He is both the sacrifice and the high priest. He fulfills both. He's the fulfillment of the substitutionary goat whose throat was exposed and was cut and died to atone for sin, but he was also the fulfillment of the scapegoat who, in God's mercy, bears my sins away. He fulfills it all. Everything pointed to him. Everything points to the person and the work of Christ. My sins are gone. And he sympathizes with my weaknesses, with my struggles, with my temptations. So justice is getting what we deserve. And in that context, sin is dangerous. But he says here that we can approach his throne and find mercy. Mercy is not getting what I deserve because I have a merciful high priest because God is merciful to us. It's his throne that we're talking about. Boldly approaching, coming into his presence. The veil was torn. And, and, and when that veil was torn, they sewed it back up, which was a joke. But the veil was torn, opening the way for full, unlimited access to God himself. He pours out his mercy. And he gives us his grace getting what we don't deserve. So justice being getting what you deserve, you don't want justice. I've told people that many times. Mercy is not getting what I deserve and grace getting what I don't deserve. Praise God for his glory. Uh, I look at this, I look at the things that, that vie for our attention, that compete for our affections in our culture, I see the big deal, the big machine, the big religious machine. I look at all, some of that stuff, it's just sickening. And yet I look at the simplicity of the message, the simplicity of the cross, the simplicity of the grace of God. And how grateful am I? How grateful are we that we are children of the King who is merciful, who is our great high priest, who's passed through the heavens, ministering to us from heaven, and we're going to look at this high priest more in the weeks and months to come. The writer devotes several chapters here to this, many facets that we'll look at. But I love the way he introduces this high priest saying, you know what, you're kind of like that animal, but by the grace of God, he says, no, no, I took your place and I took, I died the death that you deserved, that you could live the life that I deserved. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this brief look at the high priesthood of Christ and, and, and how you just, Lord, you tagged so many things in this short passage that the things that you're doing in our hearts, in our lives, that...